All right. I call to order a meeting of the North Andover School Committee Thursday, March 17th, 2022, and we will begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge, Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Correct. Okay. Uh, thank you. And just a reminder to make sure your cell phones are on vibrate or silence, if you don't mind. Uh, so we'll begin with public comment. Uh, I'll just start quickly virtually. Uh, Ms. Picard, I do not believe there were any dial-in requests. Is that nothing changed since five, correct? Correct. Okay, perfect. Any public comments from the room? Right. Mr. McDevitt? Yes. Do you, do you want to do a roll call to say who's in the meeting? Um, sure. Um, we'll do a roll call of who's in the meeting. So, uh, Ms. Petrowski, um, Ms. Petrowski is in the room. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Ms. Vitsky? Yes. Ms. Mabley? Yes. Um, and the chair is in the room present. Uh, and Ms. Picard, uh, you are virtually, correct? Correct. All right. Um, Dr. Gilligan, also, you want to? Doc, uh, Greg Gilligan, the superintendent's in the room, along with our students virtually, Ethan and Lindsay. And we have Assistant Superintendent Lorene Marks present, um, Executive Director of Special Education, Masi Bakuzi here, and Assistant Superintendent for Finance and Operations, Dr. Jim Mealy. All right. All right. Uh, <clears throat> any uh, public comment from the public? Okay. Or the present, uh, I guess I should say. All right. Uh, so we will start with uh, 3A for the Merrimack uh, Valley Striders donation. Uh, Tom, do you want to? Come up to the microphone and. Andrew and board um, and all of you, thank you for having me here. Uh, this is actually the fourth visit that I've made here um, uh, on behalf of the Merrimack Valley Striders Running Club. Uh, as you probably, hopefully all know, uh, we have this little event that we put on on Thanksgiving morning. <laughs> and uh, this has now been going on for 34 years. And um, it's been a very fortunate uh, uh, circumstance for our club to have this event because what it's done for us is it's uh, allowed us to have the wherewithal to really do some community outreach. And there's some, been some very important things that we've done that um, really hit the mission statement of our running club, which is to encourage and enhance running at all levels. We particularly have a very soft spot for uh, youth uh, because actually we're trying to lower the average age of our running club. <laughs> and I'm kind of working against that tide, but um, so we, we have uh, some very active programs. We do have a youth program that, that we support. And each year uh, we give 10 $2,000 scholarships to Merrimack Valley High School. Uh, and each year we always are sure that at least one student from North Andover receives that, that scholarship. Um, so one of the other things that we decided a number of years, as, years ago is that we needed to do a bit more in community outreach and, and in a way to give back to the communities that support us. You know, you see us out running on your roads, you see us running on your track, um, and um, you know, runners can sometimes be a little bit annoying, but we think it's a pretty wonderful sport that has no age barriers. So uh, the first, the very first uh, outreach program that we decided that we wanted to do was to in some way to be able to support the North Andover track because it's a fabulous facility. It's absolutely amazing. Uh, the design of it was done very, very well. And uh, it's a valuable asset and I know it gets used a lot. And we're on it periodically as well, so we love being on that as well. So we made a decision that we would, uh, wanted to do a grant to support that in the amount of $10,000 per year for uh, five years. And this is our fourth year. So we're really pleased to be able to, to do that. And I will tell you, the last couple of years has been a little bit interesting. Um, you, uh, I'm not sure if you're aware, but we had pandemic. <laughs> and uh, it kind of interrupted operations for a lot of um, uh, uh, facilities and functions. I, I think maybe you may have had some issues with that. Well, we did too. Um, and we really got a little bit nervous about Feast of Five. Uh, two years ago, uh, the first year that we were dealing with the pandemic, no road race had ever done a virtual event. 
And uh, we realized pretty quickly that we weren't going to be able to put a, a, the, the event on, on the streets. So this idea of a virtual event uh, began to bubble up. And uh, so we decided that, well, maybe that's the direction we had to go in. So we began contacting all of our uh, the relationships we have within the industry, including Dave McGilvery, who's our race director, and everybody else we could think of, say, how, how do you put on a, a, a virtual event? And they'll say, I don't know. Never <laughs> done it. You're writing the book, so let us know how it goes. Um, well, it was uh, nearly a disaster. Um, it, we, we lost our shirts. And um, th this past year, we decided, well, finally, the pandemic is over, and, and we've got clear sailing. And uh, the governor said, put your road races on. Everything's fine. No problem at all. The town of Andover said, sure, here are your permits. Go run your road race. And then, then this um, variant popped up. And it was like, well, maybe you're going to put your road race on. Maybe you're not. So uh, again, we uh, went through uh, all of the agony uh, with putting on an event. Not even close to what you folks have to put up with, I'm sure. But. Uh, what it did mean for us is that uh, the amount of revenue that we collected for, from the race was severely li limited over the last two years. The good news is that this year, we're already planning, this is our 35th, and we're pretty darn sure that everything is going to be perfect, the pandemic is over, life is back to normal, and we're confident that uh, uh, next year about this time, we'll be coming back with one more envelope for you. So it's uh, my great honor to do this on behalf of the Merrimack Valley Striders. So thank you. Awesome. Uh, so we're just, thank you. We're just going to just see if anyone from the committee has any questions for you. Sure. That's okay. All right. Uh, we'll start virtually. Ms. Picard? I'm all set. Thank you so much, Tom. Ms. Petrowski? Um, no, thank you. Ms. Wies? No questions, but thank you again. Ms. Mayba? Super appreciative. Thank you. And I'm happy that you'll be able to have the race yeah, in November. Do. Yeah, this is awesome. Thank you so much. And uh, I know that uh, everybody looks forward to, I'm not sure the running, but the pie at the end is <laughs> yeah. what they uh, suffer through all those miles for. So awesome. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. And uh, uh, Jim, I'll... Yeah, we can get a quick picture uh, and then we'll vote. Well, you're wearing that tie too, <laughs> Mr. McDevitt. You're wearing the good tie, so you got to get a picture. An appropriate tie. And I've got a green shirt. Yeah, green shirt. Perfect. Somebody awesome. should take the checklist. Perfect. Nice. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all. I'd like to take it. <laughs> 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 all right. Uh, you said we have to thank vote. you, Tom. Uh, all right. Any additional discussion with the committee? Ms. Picard, I'm seeing no shaking. All right. Uh, I will call for a roll call vote. We'll start virtually. Ms. Picard? Yes. Ms. Petrowski? Yes. Ms. Vitsky? Yes. Ms. Mabley? Yes. And the chair votes yes. 5 0. Congratulations to the North Andover Track Program for their donation. All right. So moving along, we are going to go to minutes from the meeting of March 3rd, 2022. Uh, and the draft minutes are attached in the packet. So. I'll move that we accept the minutes from March 3rd as presented in the packet. Second. Right. Motion made by uh, Ms. Vitsky, seconded by Ms. Petrowski. Uh, discussion. Okay. Seeing none, hearing none, I'll call a roll call vote for meetings, minutes of March 3rd, 2023. Uh, Ms. Picard? 2022. 22. Sorry. <laughs> Ms. Retru uh, Ms. Picard? Yes. Uh, Ms. Petrowski? Yes. Ms. Vitsky? Yes. Ms. Mabley? Yes. And the chair votes yes. 5 0. All right. Um, Amy, we hope you're still here to vote on the minutes for 2023. <laughs> <laughs> I think that would cause a miracle. All right. Or a miracle would be required. Okay. Uh, so we're now going to move. We, I don't think we've ever done this uh, in my 10 years, and I'm, I see Stan here, so I don't know if we've ever done this going back even further, but we're going to actually vote on some amended minutes. Uh, so the minutes of February 3rd, two, 2022 have already been approved, um, but there was a uh, correction that we felt needed to be made. So we are able to do that. Uh, so I would entertain a motion regarding the minutes of February 3rd, 2022. Um, so, go ahead. How do we do that? I make a motion to amend. 
Correct. the minutes? Review and amend. Re 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 I cannot speak today. It's I don't okay. know what's going on. It's okay. Review mm -hmm. and approve the amended minutes. Okay. So I would make a motion to review and approve the amended minutes presented in the packet for February 3rd, 3rd okay. 2022. All right. Okay. Motion made. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Uh, seconded by Ms. Vitsky. All right. Discussion. Uh, Ms. Picard, would you like to... Just update. I know it is identified in the uh, minutes, but uh, do you want to give an update on the uh, sure. place, place um, where it's being corrected? Yep. It is um, on the last page, and it is um, right after Ms. Mabley withdrew her motion. Um, new business number 11A um, was tabled, uh, but then we did have a discussion about um, a trial mask period. Um, and that did not end with a vote. So technically it doesn't need to be in the minutes, but there's a lot in our minutes that doesn't end in a vote that does up, end up in our minutes. And it seemed like that would be important to have um, just for historic purposes. So Ms. Picard, are you saying it's the part that says, Ms. Picard asked the committee if there was support for a mask optional trial period. The committee discussed the pros and cons of trial period for the schools and decided it was not an option for consideration at this time? That is correct. Okay. All right. Other questions, concerns? So is that being added or removed? That added. is being added. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. All right. Seeing or hearing no other questions, uh, we'll vote on the motion. Uh, Ms. Picard? Yes. Uh, Ms. Petrowski? Yes. Ms. Vitsky? Yes. Uh, Ms. Mabley? Yes. And the chair votes yes. So the minutes from February 3rd, 2022 have been amended. Um, all right. There, we, there they are. Okay. Uh, Ethan and Lindsay, how are you guys? We're doing pretty well, thank you. Or at least I am. I probably should stop saying that. Yeah, well, I'm though. doing well, too. <laughs> you have no choice now, right? A lot of pressure. How are things at the high school? Uh, it seems pretty well. Uh, I personally hope they are for everyone else. Okay. All right. Do you have a report? Oh, okay. I, I, there was a question there. Maybe I should have picked up on that part. Uh, but yes, we'd like to. There, there is a report tonight. Uh, we would like to start out with our uh, NAS22 Future Plans Instagram page. Uh, we actually have a lot of entries here, uh, and we'd like to. Uh, tell you about all of our uh, new entries plans. Uh, Evan Purdy plans to attend at Northern Essex Community College uh, with an undecided science-based major, and he also plans to run track and field as well as pursue an associate's degree in further education at a four-year college. Michaela Vincent plans to attend Merrimack College with a double major in early childhood education and human development and human services. Uh, Audrey Mertens plans to attend Elon University uh, undecided. Tony Moran plans to attend Keene State College with a major in nursing. Billy Long plans to attend Leslie University with a major in animation and motion media. Josh Perlmutter plans to attend the University of Tampa with a major in biology on the pre-medical track. Riley Hardacre plans to attend St. Anselm College with a major in nursing. Zanim Shahzad plans to attend the University of Connecticut with a major in biology. Jenna Bard plans to attend the University of Maine with a double major in communications and liberal arts. Andrew Jones plans to attend Fairfield University with a major in international business. Coralise Gonzalez-Soto plans to attend uh, Southern New Hampshire University with a major in criminal justice. Ella Rowe plans to attend Penn State University with a major in finance. And finally, Christina Dubois plans to attend the University of New Hampshire with a major in psychology. Uh, and those are all the students who, we re who we've received uh, new plans for in the last couple of weeks. Awesome. We also have an update on senior class calendar fundraiser winners. So we have Christine Coteau and Cass Willard want gift cards to Amici's and Jamie's. Deb Webright won a $25 gift card to Shady's and an NA Golf umbrella. Elizabeth Crosby won an NA Yeti and a gift card to Heavenly's. Uh, Lair Fair want a raffle basket from Restoration Barbershop. Grazia Donahue won a gift card to Restoration Barbershop. And Victoria Vissering won a gift card to Shenju. Christine Michelini won a gift card to Perfectos and an NA Camelback. McKenna Bambury won a gift card to Rose and Dove and an NA Camelback. 
Congrats to all the most recent winners of this fundraiser and consider donating to the senior class as this not only helps the high school, but also helps support local businesses as well. Awesome. Um, we also have an update for sports. It's just the fact that online registration for spring sports has now closed. But if you still consider to um, play a spring sport and you have not registered yet, please see Miss Gagne in the athletic office as soon as possible. Uh, just recently, our North Inver High School math team uh, took part in a statewide competition. Uh, they actually placed 11th in the state, which is really impressive, third in their playoff division, and third in our region. Uh, and we'd like to give special congratulations to sophomore student Owen Raisin for being ranked in the top 20 overall scores, which is wicked impressive. <laughs> that is. Um, recently, senior Alexis Gutman organized a fundraiser for Ukraine Refugee Aid Relief. And she raised a total of, sorry, let me get this up. A whopping $549.12. All of that will go towards uh, aid and relief for those in Ukraine that need it the most right now. So kudos to her. Awesome. Uh, we'd also like to provide an update on uh, VEX Robotics. Uh, two of our teams competed in the uh, Southern New England Regional Competition. Uh, and congrats to the team of Dan Middleman, Zoe Levin, Luke Ralph, Keenan Goslin, and Jonathan Hale for winning the Think Award and for also qualifying for the VEX World Robotics Competition. Uh, congrats again to the students who have accomplished this and for all the students who competed uh, and also for their advisor, Mr. Motherway at the high school, who helped to make this possible. We also have a lot more winners from the NASDECA competition that was held on March 10th and 11th. We had 43 students travel to Boston to represent NAS and compete in the State DECA Conference for the first time since the pandemic. Um, NAS won first place earning gold recertification for their school-based enterprise, Retail Services, which was led by Casey Goland and Karen Muldoon. Um, first place earning gold for school-based enterprise and food led by Ali Sherlock, Samantha Melville, Melville and Zoe Levin. Ali Sherlock fi finished in top five as a social media correspondent. Dan and Martin finished um, in the top five, and he's a freshman qualifier, so props to him. Our top 10 qualifiers include Lily Scappa, Chloe Zdrowski in Business and Law, Aiden Butterfield, Matt Cookin, and Matt McDevitt in International Business Plan. Congrats. Uh, in addition at the high school, next week is the ELA MCAS uh, for our sophomore class. Um, Chromebooks and Chromebook chargers will not be provided, so uh, for any sophomore students watching, please remember to charge and bring your own Chromebooks uh, for the test. Uh, if you are experiencing troubles with your Chromebook, please report it to the IT department uh, ASAP or submit a help ticket uh, through the link provided on Principal Jackson's Principal's Update number 22. The North Andover High School yearbook needs your help. Um, attention freshmen, sophomores, juniors, and seniors at NAS. Uh, please submit candidates, either take it at school or not at school, especially if you have any photos of any events at the high school. Send it to Nas Yearbook 2022 on Instagram, all lowercase and no space, or email it to yearbook committee members Haley Wong, Nicole Olson, or Anya Kachulis Moriarty. Uh, also, a cool fact uh, that we just recently uh, found out. Uh, the Eagle Scouts uh, of North Andover have their first two female members, uh, both seniors from the high school. Uh, Marie Hurst and Abigail Phillips. Uh, I, as I hear, earning the rank of Eagle Scout is a huge, huge achievement that requires a lot of service and work for like a, a bunch of years. Uh, so huge congrats to all of our students who have worked so hard to earn this rank. Uh, but we thought it would be really cool to mention uh, these two students' accomplishments as well. So congratulations to Marie and Abigail again. Um, another notable mention is that the semi-formal was a success last week. Uh, last Friday, the freshman and sophomore semi-formal took place at South Tours, um, and it turned out to be a huge success. So shout out to the advisors and the class officers that planned this. Um, to our 10 freshman class officers, CCP Choi, Daniel Lennon, Harper Berrios, Linda King, Nathan Permuter, Prahab Jong Pali, Sama Mun Muzanar, Sanghan Shin, and Trevor Wadaka. And to our sophomore class officers, President Ben Abbott, Vice President Murray, Maria Benuto, Secretary Ronan O'Carroll, and Treasurer William Mertens. In addition, uh, this past weekend, the Massachusetts Association of Student Councils held their annual state conference uh, at Worcester State University. A group of students uh, from student council and attendance to learn 
valuable leadership lessons and interact with student leaders from all over the state of Massachusetts. Also, uh, the North Inver High School choirs will be competing at the Micah Choral Festival uh, on April 1st, and the North Inver High School bands and choirs will be performing at the Boston World Strides event uh, on the weekend of April 9th and 10th. Uh, and we're really excited for our high school musicians to represent our school in front of uh, many other uh, talented music associations. We have an update on the North Inver Public Schools Voluntary at Home Rapid, rapid Test Program for North Inver High School. The next distribution date will be Friday, April 1st. We do have tests available in the main office if your student needs one prior to April 1st. And the future date distribution dates will be uh, April 29th and 527th. Uh, in other news, the North Denver High School Model United Nations has a conference uh, called Eagle Monk in Boston on the weekend of April 1st, 2nd, and 3rd. Uh, our delegates will be debating and drafting legislation in general assemblies and crisis committees uh, with passionate Model UN students uh, from various other schools. Uh, and good luck to our delegates from our North Denver High School Model United Nations. We also have an exciting event coming up at the Youth Center. Uh, it's the Center Job Fair that will be held on Wednesday, April 6th. The time is 6 to 8 p.m. It's going to be held at the Youth Center and admission is free. However, registration is required. So please visit the website www.nayouth.com slash job fair. Remember to prepare your resume and this is available to students aged 15 to 18. Uh, a pretty cool announcement. Uh, North Denver High School is holding a, another rally uh, on April 1st. It will be for our Nights Care Week. Uh, we'll be focusing especially on having high club participation from the high school and showing that uh, Nights care for our mental health, our extracurriculars, our environment and service, our community and each other, which are the themes for uh, each day of the week. We're very excited to bring the high school together again for another day of fun games and uh, friendly rivalry between our grades. The North Andover Muslim Student Association is preparing an inter uh, Muslim Student Association, bringing in together the Andover Muslim Student Association as well as the Lowell uh, Muslim Student Association. Um, to celebrate Ramadan. This will be held April 1st from times 4 to 8 p.m. at the North Denver High School cafeteria. There will be a calligraphy workshop, speakers from the Muslim Student Association UMass Lowell, games and competitions, and food. The registration fee is $10, and if you would like to sign up to register, um, visit North Denver High School MSA's Instagram page, and we hope to see you there. Also, uh, college decisions uh, for regular decision applicants are uh, currently being released from a lot of schools. Uh, so we expect to be receiving a lot of entries on the North Denver High School 22 Future Plans Instagram page. Uh, and we're really excited for our seniors to make their plans for after high school. And the last thing that we have on our agenda is probably the most anticipated thing of the night. It is the Mr. N.A. showing. Um, this is Friday, March 18th at 7 p.m. tomorrow. Doors open at 6.40. Tickets are on sale at the door for $20. Um, this is, again, the largest SOS fundraiser for the senior class. So not only will you be supporting those participating in the show as they've worked extremely hard to get this all set up, but also you'll be supporting the best activity for seniors this year. Go get your friends and family and head on over to the show tomorrow. And at school is the last day to get your ticket for a discounted price at $15. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. That's it. All right. Uh, any, <clears throat> excuse me, we'll just uh, see if there's any quick questions for you guys. Uh, Ms. Picard, we'll start with you. I, I just really want to thank you. This is such an exciting time of year with math team and robotics and DECA and Model UN and, you know, and all those things that are happening. Um, I think that's really great. Um, but I wanted to comment how thankful I am that you um, bring to us the names of all these students who are doing a great job. I know it means a lot to the community to hear real names. Um, and it's not easy to say the names of, you know, all your classmates, but I'm so thankful that you do that. Um, and thankful that you'll do that at graduation as well. Um, I just think it's so meaningful when, um, you know, students hear their names from their peers. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Ms. Petras. Uh, no questions. Um, lots of great news and everything going on. It's nice to have business as usual, and you guys did a fantastic job tonight. Thank you. Ms. Vizky. Thank you very much for another great report. Ms. Mabel. Thank you for your excellent job tonight, and thank you for the whole year. Um, I look forward to following the Instagram and seeing what happens with the two of you, and appreciate um, what you've done this year. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I'm just going to say, 
you guys always do an absolutely incredible job. Um, but I think this may have been one of your best reports yet. Um, you know, just really covering, you know, so many things going on um, with the school year. Um, you know, some of it, you know, is in part because it's springtime and it's kind of, you know, competitions are, are coming up. But uh, – or, or have, have taken place, but, you know, really great job. And, and as Ms. Picard said, you know, really recognizing not just that, you know, this program did this, but who those student participants uh, were, um, you know, is, is really meaningful to, I think, to everybody. I did think one thing was kind of funny when you um, were talking about the uh, MCAS. You know, I remember when I would take tests of that nature, you know, it was remember to bring two pencils um, <laughs> in case the first one broke. And, and your advice was make sure your computer's charged. You don't get a charger. Um, so I, I thought that was really funny. Um, it probably shows a little bit too much of my age. And you, you guys are like number two pencils. But um, great report. And uh, I'm very much uh, looking forward to seeing your, uh, your post on Instagram for where you guys are going to. So thank you. Thank you very much. All right. And Thank again, you. you're, you're welcome to stay. You're welcome to leave. <laughs> Either way. All right. Uh, Dr. Gilligan, uh, the health update. Well, that's, that's a tough act to follow. That was outstanding tonight. Thank you. Um, we are going to start with the health update. I'm going to give it tonight. Um, Cheryl Barzak's been just about to every meeting, I think, now uh, since March of 2020. <laughs> and, um, you know, I'll be reporting tonight, and we'll have her back um, as needed. So it's um, a subpar report tonight. Maybe. <laughs> Touche. Harsh. Touche. Um, so um, this week, thank you, Dr. Bailey, um, we're at 12 cases uh, of COVID-19, and that is as of uh, today, um, 12 cases in the district. Next slide. Um, I think that shows you, and I think you're all well aware of where we were right after the new uh, start of the new year um, and to where we are today. Um, Next is the total cases per week, and so from the 10th through the 16th, um, we had a total of 14 new cases. And last but not least, this is uh, the vaccination percentage. And um, I think really important, I wanted to mention, uh, tomorrow we'll have uh, the newsletter go out, the nightly news will go out, and we'll have information in the nightly news about um, vaccination clinics coming up uh, for elementary who wanna participate voluntarily. So we'll have that information in the nightly news. And um, that is the health update for tonight. Okay. Um, moving along, I am going to ask Ms. Marks to talk about a, a couple things. Uh, kindergarten registration as well as kindergarten information night. And if uh, you guys, um, it's linked to the agenda, but if you look to your packet, um, there's some late additions that we added in with kindergarten information night and uh, the registration. So Assistant Superintendent Marks. Okay. Um, registration first please so um, just a reminder that if you have a student who's eligible to attend kindergarten this year if you go to the website under about us if you scroll down a little Jim you will see you don't want to drop down menu you want me to scroll down oh go ahead I, from my link it brings you right to the student registration yep so all the information is there so it's right on the website under about us and you can um, register your student remotely that way. And then we also have um, the next, the kindergarten night. I'm going to click on that one. So for the first time in two years, again, due to the pandemic, like many others have mentioned tonight, we have our in-person kindergarten information night. And that will happen on Thursday, April 7th at the middle school at 7 p.m. And you will meet Dr. Goddard, um, the principal of the ABIC, and we will talk about registration, um, health and safety, transportation, food services. Um, we'll talk about, uh, usually Rick Gallant is there to talk about Breakfast Club and Kids Stop. We will also um, have screening dates at that time. Um, in the past, pre-COVID, screening took place around um, Memorial Day. We are not going to do that this year. We are going to screen in the summer again. Um, and so students will not miss those two, two days of school this year. So right. which um, Dr. Goddard really advocated for and um, I, we think makes a lot of sense. So, so um, please try to attend that. It, it's, a, it's a good night. It'll be nice to see people um, excited about having their kids come into school again. So um, next thing, these are all just kind of informational pieces. Um, as, as everyone knows, we do a um, collaborative project with the Stevens Public Library. 
and we um, do North Andover, uh, an event called North Andover Reads, which typically, um, this year anyway, and oftentimes is in the fall. Um, we were not able to get an author to speak in the fall to our students. So our, our um, theme was First Neighbor Still Friends, and we talked about indigenous people. So we do have an author visit coming on April 1st to our elementary schools. It will be a virtual um, author visit, and she'll be um, talking about her new um, nonfiction book, which is always um, interesting. You know, when I first started teaching, I thought kids didn't like nonfiction, and kids love nonfiction. Lots of good stuff there for kids. And there, she is going to talk about um, the night sky, and she will tie in indigenous um, people hmm. to that. So we're, we're really excited and looking forward to um, Catherine Hulick coming to speak to our students. And, and the last... Su go super ahead. Is she... A Local or a resident? Local. She yes. is, she is a resident. Yes. She looks very familiar yep. to me, and that's why. But um, she's actually a sister of one of our staff members. Okay. Yeah. All right. That could be it too. Yeah. All right. All right. So we're very excited. Looking forward to that. And then um, Ethan already mentioned a couple of things I was going to mention um, here, but I um, was just paying attention last week or so to a STEM newsletter that the high school does, and I thought that I should make other people aware of this because it's a really great newsletter. Um, and the, the newsletter, they do talk about the math team and how well they were doing. Now, this came out a couple weeks ago, so I think we had a little updated information there. Um, also talk about the robotics team. But in the newsletter, um, they talk about the science team, which I don't think we hear too much about. And also, I thought this was really interesting. There's a program available to 11th grade girls who have um, completed some AP science work. Um, through Boston University, and it looks like a great opportunity. They receive a stipend, they work in labs, so if students are interested, they need to apply by April 15th. So I just wanted to share um, that there is a group that, of students who put this out monthly. So it's really, um, I think it's a lot of good work. Awesome. So. Can, can we try to make sure that that's um, linked into the website if it's not? Yes, Okay. will do that. Because that, yeah. I mean, is... I know it came out in Yes, yeah, that's where I, I saw it. I saw yeah. it in Chet's newsletter, what, and I've I thought, wow, this is really of, good. Last yeah. couple of months, yeah. yeah, it, yeah. It's it would be really great to highlight some of this stuff. That's yeah. fantastic. Perhaps perhaps link it to the nightly news as well. Yeah, we can look at can that. Yeah, that. It's also linked to tonight's agenda as well. Mm -hmm. So, good. Um, and last but not least, we'll send out, um, before I turn it over to uh, Ms. Bacuzzi to talk about special Wait, education. Wait, there's one more thing. Go ahead. Oh, I didn't have that on my... Oh, sorry. Sorry. Um, <laughs> before we get to the special education piece, um, I just wanted to say that um, I got some late information on the Ann Bradstreet Poetry Contest that's coming up. Um, and it is open to all who live or work or go to school in North Andover. Uh, there's five age categories, and um, we just got this information uh, from the Poet Laureate um, just a couple minutes before the meeting. <laughs> so we will uh, put that in the newsletter tomorrow as well. Uh, it sounds like Cindy Parent's going to have a busy morning putting a few things in our newsletter <laughs> additionally. Um, but I just want to say that it, it's a really cool thing, the, the Ann Bradstreet Poetry Contest. Um, and yeah. our librarians are working on this with our students. So all of our elementary librarians we have already met. Um, I know that um, our high school librarian is working on that. And actually have a, a note to just double check in with our uh, middle school librarian. But they, will, they are participating in this with our Poet Laureate. And um, I know many of us plan to attend the event. Um, that happens in town with that. So there's a lot of collaboration going on around that. And the, um, the theme is message, message in a Bottle, um, a Letter to the Future. And the um, submissions are due by the 30th of April. Thank you, Ms. Picard. Outstanding. And uh, I, at this time, I am going to turn it over to um, Marcy Bacuzzi. She's our um, Director of Special Education. Um, and she's going to give us an update on uh, special ed. Thank you. Um, so this is just meant to be an update, so I am going to go through uh, many areas that um, I'll talk about briefly. Probably any one of them could be a, a larger presentation. So um, feel free to ask questions, and certainly if there's any specific area that um, people want follow-up in in future meetings, we can talk about that as well. So these are the areas that I'm going to briefly um, get into today. Um, we're going to talk about the disability areas, out of district placements, um, some expanded partnerships that we have, 504 plans, um, social emotional well-being and learning, um, some of that you've, um, you've already seen through Nikki's presentation, Nikki Murphy's presentations, um, and then finally services that we have in supports and what we're doing for PD and training. 
So this is just, the next slide is just by the numbers. Lorraine pointed out to me, I did this a little backwards, or no, Jim pointed out to me, I did this a little backwards. I put uh, 2002, 2022 before 2021, but there it is. Um, so this is information that we um, send in and is state reported. Um, so this is pulled right from that um, state reporting information. Um, so these are, when we look at special education, these are the disability areas. And um, if you look, um, those are the percentages and the amount of students that we have qualified in each of the disability areas. Um, you know, there's always some variable of, um, you know, uh, error when, when doing reporting. So um, those, those numbers have been are pretty consistent. Um, from one year to the next, uh, we, it was, as we, we've started this process, um, and we look at this relatively frequently, because we look at it in relation to um, our evaluation numbers, which are much higher than they've been in years past. Um, but what we're seeing in the evaluation process is even though we're doing far more evaluations, we're not really seeing students qualify in a dis with a disability. Um, through that evaluation process, but um, at that, you know, we are seeing student struggles. So um, part of the conversation that Lorraine and I have a lot of conversation about and I'll talk about um, a little bit later is um, there is some conversation that, or some more conversation on learning that we need to do. Um, that's a difference between pandemic learning loss and special education and disability. So this is just kind of an overview of where we're at. And those are just primary disabilities, yep. Before you go on, um, the one that seems to have a significant uptick is developmental delay. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and because we're talking about the pandemic, developmental delay is not caused by the pandemic, right? So if you could maybe just give a little definition, that would be helpful, I think, or why you think maybe that number is so um, significantly up. Yep, so the I would suspect that, so developmental delay has a cutoff of, of an age of nine. So um, what we have seen, um, if we look at our numbers across the board, is a pretty um, significant increase of needs at the pre-K level. Um, and that is really, I, I mean, I can't, it's a direct result of obviously the pandemic and what didn't happen. Early intervention is such like, an essential tool um, that students really didn't have access to. So young students, and if they did, it was remote. And I'm sure most people have had uh, a child between the ages of two and uh, three and a half, and that probably doesn't work so well. So um, developmental disabilities, uh, or when we're looking at multiple, it could be coordination, OT, PT, and instead of it being really specific to one area, um, it really is just sort of a, a, it's more considered a global delay. So um, they're, they're often, um, in those kind of related service areas, and we often see them by that by the age of seven, eight, kind of dissipate. Okay. So I'm not Thank you. I'm not surprised to see that number. So the next slide, the next couple of slides are going to be about our out of district numbers, and for our listening audience, for those who don't know what out of district numbers, what out of district even is. Um, schools have an obligation, I, they, they say, they call it um, every school, we have to either create or locate. Um, so when districts have the availability of capacity and resource to be able to create their own programming, we create our own programming, but when uh, we do not have the capacity and resources to be able to do that for a student, our obligation is then to locate a placement. And so in the, in the state of Massachusetts and surrounding um, states, they have what, the, what are called Chapter 766 approved schools. Some are collaboratives, and Helen's talked a little bit, and we, I think just our last meeting we talked a little bit about the collaboratives, um, but there are other private schools too. Um, obviously, we, we see a decline in, um, the, it's really the next two slides, so a decline in amount of placements and a decline in obviously the amount of money that is with those placements. Um, and that can really be attributed to but there's many factors. I mean, we could have, I, I, I happen to look back in this and, um, you know, we have not had um, a student, this is like always these unknown factors, so we haven't had a move-in out of district student in two years. That's pretty significant. Um, we have certainly built capacity and expanded resources of our internal programming. 
Um, and so we're not seeing the um, amount of need to locate because we have created programming um, within the district as well. Um, we, we've had, uh, we had graduations, we've had move outs, um, and unfortunately we, we did have just this year as a result of the pandemic a dropout too. So those numbers can always, they can fluctuate. Uh, we do have, um, we do have five students that are either in process of waiting for assessments, uh, which is another piece of the process, process that um, we also ask these schools that are out of district, again, if, we, if, we're, if we're struggling with our own programming, developing, finding out really what a student needs, so those could potentially end up as placements. Um, but we've also brought students back. We've brought, um, there are three students who returned from assessments to the high school and one at the elementary school this year too. So again, those numbers mm -hmm. could change tomorrow but that's where they are right now. Um, this just in terms of, again, by the numbers, this is uh, called dark data. This is that anyone can look up online if you just Google that word, and it gives a lot of information about just um, by the numbers in North Andover and statistics. So uh, special education, the state average is 18.9%. Uh, North Andover is at 19.1. That's higher than where we've been in the in past years. Um, if I, you know, I, we, we used to hover around sev high 17. Um, so again, you know, we're, we're not that, the state average has obviously gone up as well. Um, so we're cognizant of that number and it'll kind of, we'll talk a little bit more about it later too. I'll stop for a breath and I know that was, so that was a, a first chunk of information. So if anybody has any questions at this point, if I, I not, just, I'll kind of forge on. Yeah, I, I don't know, um, Ms. Picard, if you have any, Ms. Petrosky? No, I was just, well, I guess sort of um, on the students who are out of district mm -hmm. is, can and I, maybe this isn't the right time, but is there like a, a yearly evaluation on whether or not, like I know we have yearly IEP meetings, mm -hmm. is that, in that a meeting, is it, did, my words aren't coming today. Yes. <laughs> I can tell you, yeah, let me, I can maybe, so there, it is evaluated on a yearly, so it's a yearly, they, same, same process as here, and placement is evaluated on a yearly basis, okay. at, or sooner or later, so okay. at any time. So we do have a, a which I used to be here, um, but they, uh, we do have an out of district coordinator, um, and she's responsible for um, kind of keeping track of what's going on, doing observations, um, and really having, a, um, working on that piece, that connection between um, what a student needs in the out of district placement and having conversations with me and we have follow up conversations of can we bring that here. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, out of district placements are, you know, they're struggling with the same staffing issues. So when I say we have five students waiting for placements, that has gone on since December. Um, wh what that has, again, given us an opportunity to do is create what those students also need here. Right. So um, it's kind of been a, a double edged sword a little bit. Yeah. And since all the plans are individualized, but you know, ultimately the goal is if we can bring someone back to our district, we we want to do so. And we've had right. a lot of success with that. We have right. we, so. That's why I wanted to just make it clear that this isn't they're not just gone. They're no. evaluated every yep. year, and so that opportunity to come back and mm -hmm. and then I'm thinking like, is it just naturally like are there more transitions do you see between like the great the grade levels like from the early childhood to the um, elementary and then maybe from the elementary to the middle or the middle to the high school like is that kind well, of just naturally where it would happen or not necessarily not necessarily I, I you know at one point I might say yes there, there, there could be but the through the through line in everything that I could talk about this year as far as placement is social emotional and yeah. mental health needs I mean yeah. there's there's just I mean it's it's significant it's severe it's impactful um, and worrisome you know that's yeah. but that is the absolute through through line of each and every one of them that's happened in the last 16 months, you know. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, just two quick questions. Mm -hmm. uh, the out of district that we're spending the r approximately 4.5 million, does that include transportation it or not? It does not include Do we have our transportation cost on that? I, I could get them, I do not have them. Okay, all right. Um, and then the second is, you know, we're, we're a little higher than the state average, mm -hmm. right? Not dramatically. Mm -hmm. um, and I think in, on one hand, you know, we've put a number of programs in, in place so that, you know, we, we are keeping students closer to home mm -hmm. and, and neighborhood schools, things of that nature. Um, but a number of years ago that we very much had a reputation when, uh, you know, a child went in to, 
to be evaluated or at a hospital, right? They, if they didn't necessarily live in North Andover, they were being told that our programs were, were good, right? And so I know for a number of years we had families move here mm -hmm. as a result of that. Is that reputation still there? Are you still kind of hearing that? Is that maybe why we're a little higher? I'm, I'm just curious. I mean, over the years, our moving <coughs> population has been pretty significant. Um, and our, we, I mean, our, our, you know, I think our programming's fantastic. We have, um, unlike other districts, we, I look at our RISE programs, pre-K, I mean, K through um, 12. Um, so, you know, when I look, again, being in on a district and just meeting in, with community members, um, areas that other districts struggle with in terms of needing to locate as rather than create we're not seeing those same issues um, if I, 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 I can get numbers and we're probably um, would be pretty eye-opening again it's it's the mental health needs of the students that are, yeah. are driving those numbers right now and have in the past but not <coughs> to the extent now so uh, I will I mean I just got a call from a neighboring town um, this week about wanting to tuition a student into our district and so we've gone many of those um, Unfortunately, uh, we can do that at times, but other times our own capacity is limiting us We we, we know what our our building capacity issues and space capacity issues are so But it is testament to the, the work that you guys have done and the capacity you build because oftentimes what you see in other communities They might have a terrific elementary program and then it just it, it, it falls off and that's right. where you see some of these placements and um, a lot of the conversation, at least since, since I've been here, is, is a bit about vertical programming. So it's, you know, we got off track, like everybody, with, with pandemic conversations. Um, but um, we, we do, you know, to eliminate to the point of, like, is it, does it happen elementary to middle, middle to high? So we do a lot, have, have a lot of conversation about vertical planning to avoid those kind of pitfall areas. So just to answer your question, out of district transporta uh, transportation, ranges from a million to a million point two each okay. year. Um, and it fluctuates, obviously, from the number of students, but also um, NRT will pool if there are uh, students from neighboring towns going to the same school, then instead of it costing you the whole cost of that ride, they'll divide it by the number of students oh, okay. on that. So Makes it can sense. fluctuate for that, too. Okay, awesome. Thank you. I, I actually thought it was a little bit higher than that, so, um, okay, thanks. So this is all the really exciting stuff. Um, you know, we. This is just really. Um, you know, I can't necessarily created all these situations, but we've expanded a lot of these situations. Um, I can talk separately about Landmark and our language-based program. Um, Dr. Susan Bruce, uh, she works for BC and she's done professional development. One of, when you talk about the programs that we're known for, our multiple support program. Um, Oh, sorry. Um, Shannon Clow at Sergeant School, and now um, uh, uh, Sandra, whose name is going to slip my now, at the middle school, a uh, Christensen, Sandra Christensen at the middle school, um, are multiple supports, and those are our highest needs students, um, are just amazing. And so Dr. Susan Bruce, who, has, who is an expert in that area, um, has been doing some consulting with them just about um, curriculum and programming just to make what wonderful things they do even better. Um, one of the things that I, when I came on was pretty evident is that the Center for Communication and Enhancement at Children's Hospital, um, Laura Lynn Chetwin is our, um, she's a um, teacher of the deaf, but that's not what she does for us, but we have a lot of hearing equipment needs in this district more than one could ever imagine. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not that we have a huge amount of direct service needs for students with hearing impairment. Most of them are accommodations and on 504s, but the equipment needs are unreal. Um, and you know, we don't have new buildings. The equipment needs become that much more of a need. Um, and so she's been fantastic in training the teachers, working with families, um, you know, personal FM systems, hooking those up. Um, so that's been a, a wonderful addition to what we have here. Um, we expanded our uh, music therapy program to all of our um, sub-separate programs uh, at, from uh, elementary through high school. Um, and I, I can't say enough about uh, Rick Gorman and Rick Alant. So it's, it's super important to me, and I could talk forever, but I won't, about um, how important I feel like inclusive practices are. And they really... I mean, 
are, uh, I, Rick Gallant, it, it, you know, the answer is yes before the question comes out. So um, the support that I've had from um, him and Rick Gorman as far as um, making sure that all students um, have access to our community events and programs um, has been fantastic. Um, the parent liaisons, I think Lorraine has spoken about them before, um, but in, in terms of our connecting with our, some of our community members that maybe have not felt a way to connect with us in the past, um, they have been, I mean, everything from going to doctor's appointments to um, helping fill out paperwork to getting a pair of sneakers. So they've done amazing things. Um, we have uh, Wilson certification, one of my other kind of passion areas is with our language-based programming in the district. Um, so over the past um, just year and a half, we've sent 13 teachers through the um, Wilson One certification program. Um, so they, we, we will continue to send teachers. I think that's just an important aspect of our programming here. Um, and we will probably, if um, allowed, if I can figure everything out, also send a couple of teachers to Wilson too. Um, we had a couple that already did the two-day overview. Um, so that is, uh, Wilson is a, um, a um, evidence-based reading program for, that's based in phonics and um, it is a, you know, when we talk about the reading needs of students, it's not, not all students need to learn with Wilson, um, but it's great for, to have as a resource, especially for, you know, what we're seeing now with some struggling readers early on with phonics. Um, Occupational therapy services, we, we made a huge transition this year. We've for many years have contracted with OTR, with Karen Heffler's um, business, and she's wonderful and her people are wonderful, um, but um, pandemic led to a lot of part-time people and a lot of staff um, changing. We are a large district, we have a lot of uh, OT services. Um, so we have severed that partnership, but she allowed us um, because uh, whether People realize that some of Karen's staff have worked with us for over 15 years. So um, they have stayed with us and they are fantastic and that has um, totally stopped the turnover of staffing because that was really the biggest concern with some of the people. And again, it wasn't that they weren't wonderful, it was the turnover piece of it. So we, I'm happy to say we've had no turnover <laughs> in our OT providers. Um, and then this, the collaboration now between CPAC and Apron. Um, Lisa and Courtney are, couldn't be better to, to work with. Um, they have a lot of great ideas. Um, we had, as you guys, Sarah Ward, I talked a little bit about, um, that was super well attended. She presented to our elementary school and preschool teachers yesterday, and she'll present to our high school teachers um, on uh, April 27th. So just a lot of really exciting, you know, even through a pandemic, we've kind of um, been trudging a little bit, but a lot of, you know, as I, I, as I looked at the pieces, a lot, of, a lot of exciting things that we've been doing. All right, so then next on, and we're going to talk a little bit about our 504 plan. So there are 504 um, building-based um, liaisons, and those are our guidance counselors. And then for the district, I am the district 504 liaison coordinator. Um, and so uh, through the pandemic and how hard our guidance counselors work and how overworked and um, wonderful work they're doing with Nikki and the SEL, one of the things we really had to do was look at our 504 plans in general. So, um, and, and it really started just kind of with the basic of the form. So we were, people were using different forms, they were using different methods. Um, so the transition of forms wasn't so clean. So back in December, we have adopted a new set of forms. Um, I have trained the elementary school people, middle school and high school will be training. Um, and it's not really a training, it's just really, um, a, a different understanding and layout um, of the forms and will be my, it, the, the, and we had to do it for many reasons, one of which we have to make sure that the Office of Civil Rights um, is, that information is updated on those forms and it changes periodically. So it's been vetted by the Office of Civil Rights. The, the forms are much more parent friendly. And again, it's gonna be consistent. So when you go from elementary to middle school, things aren't gonna necessarily look different for families. That's great. And so the migration of that, those forms, it's, you know, I, I, we were hoping it was gonna happen sooner or later, but re in reality, the, the, what the guidance counselors are doing right now with kind of the hands-on work that they have to do with the SEL needs, it, this kind of fell to the back. So um, they're being trained this year and then we'll, they'll be implemented next year. And these are just 504 by the numbers. 
and I'll stop after this because I'm positive there will be questions after this because I had questions after I saw this too. So if there are, and I can just say, you know, I, I can just give a little like sort of overview because I know there'll, if we look at the numbers and the, the kind of the whys, some whys, I, I don't really have answers for. I mean, the, the ABECC, we obviously, I think it makes sense that those could potentially be lower numbers based on the students there. And um, it's integrated preschool, so there's a lot of accommodations just happening 20, you know, all, all day long. Um, the elementary school numbers are, you know, there's some outliers there. Um, the high school numbers, this is, um, shouldn't, it, it's not a surprise, uh, being someone who was a high school, worked solely at a high school before, um, a lot of students in middle school and high school start coming off IEPs and going on to 504, so those numbers tend to be higher. And at high school, there is a, there is a push for students to go on 504s. Um, for accommodations and things like SATs and college and having that updated information. So um, IEPs do not follow students to college, accommodations do. So accommodations are much more easily uh, spelled out on a 504 plan than a um, IEP. So I mean, there's still an eligibility process um, to, go, to go through when we go through the 504 process, um, but you know, it, it is, it's not, an, it, I wasn't surprised necessarily to see that number. Any questions on what I've gone through thus far? Uh, we'll start virtually, Ms. Picard. Yeah, I would start with, um, with a question about the 504 plans. Um, do we have a comparison year over year? Like, are we higher with 504s than we were before? Like, you had that, um, that year over year comparison with the, with the IEPs? Uh, I didn't ask them, but I can certainly ask them for that. Uh, I, I suspect we we see about the same, but I can I don't have that information at hand, but I can certainly get it. Okay, and you're not surprised by these numbers? These seem reasonable to you. Yep. Okay. Um, and then um, just for clarification, my understanding is that a 504 carries not only to college but to the workplace as well. Is that right? Correct. Well, the, any accommodation. Yep. Okay. And and. One can only get a 504 before they graduate from high school, is that right? Say that again? One can only get a 504, an accommodation, before they graduate from high school. I'm not sure what the, I don't. You're saying once you graduate, you can't get one. Oh, yes, no. Yes, you can. Yeah, yeah, yes, you can. You can? Yep. Oh, okay, that's good information. It's not necessarily North Hanover Public Schools, but that's. Is, um, is it limited by age? No, no. No? No, okay. so we, like, we would have to do, in a workplace, Hmm? ADA. It's under the ADA. Okay. Yeah, it falls under federal law, so. Yep. Okay. I, I always think of it as being school student based. And, and school based, so um, interesting. Cool. Thank you. That's all I have for right now. Awesome. All right, Ms. Petrowski. Uh, no, Helen also asked my question about the comparison of numbers. That's, that's all pretty clear. Thank you. My question is the <laughs> language based program. Do we have that at every level? Yep. Yeah. I'm going to do, um, oh, do we, have, up? <laughs> we have it, uh, not, uh, we could talk about special, special education programming at the end, but we have it elementary through program through middle school, and then it looks a little bit different in high school because of. So mm -hmm. actually my, my one comment was going to be, I remember, I guess like seven years ago, hearing through friends because our older kids were going into middle school and they were really nervous about the, what had been a cliff when they left elementary school that everything fell apart and all their accommodations or they just were getting lost in the shuffle. Um, and so I'm guessing that seven years ago there would have been very weak numbers in high school um, and probably middle school as well. And so it's actually very good to see yeah. that there are numbers because kids were, were getting lost. At least that's what I had been told. So um, I'm, I'm happy to see that. I, and I there's better protection or, or accommodations for kids in middle and high school. And it is protection isn't necessarily a wrong word either because I, I again going back years I feel like there was this sense of like you you had to be on an IEP and then we looked at IEPs and it was an accommodation because people felt that 504s didn't have the teeth right. that an IEP had but that's just not the reality of the situation. And I also remember friends saying that their children were uncomfortable they didn't want to be known as having these accommodations mm -hmm. and it was in we're going so, to talk about accommodations too more because that's a, you know there's a whole other like you know good teaching practice tier one tier two tier three which we'll talk about a little right. bit about too but um, yeah I mean I, I I our guidance counselors again they they really do a fantastic job 
We have been on top of making sure how the information gets out to teachers. Um, it's a little bit easier for the high school at this point, not having that rotation of teachers, you know, because mm -hmm. things got sometimes got lost in that. Um, but that has the, the push as far as um, with is really making sure the information gets to who the information needs to right. get to. So that that was um, a parent, a pretty significant parent concern for when I came in too. Right, absolutely. So I just wanted to make that comment. Thanks. Uh, this is really good, you know, so far I think I've got some questions on the on the tiers coming up, but one of the things that I think I constantly forget, and you just reminded us again, is that IEPs don't follow the student kind of post-graduation, uh, and that the 504s do, um, and I think I always kind of forget that, so as you kind of even talk about these numbers at the high school level, um, it, it makes even more sense, so. Um, and, and I didn't realize, I, I've always thought of it as a school-based thing, so. Um, that, that was interesting to learn tonight too. Mm -hmm. So awesome. Thank you. I guess uh, something else that I won't talk about forever, but I could talk <laughs> about forever is um, the tiered level support. Lorena and I talk about this probably, mm, we'll, we'll say at nauseum um, because it's super. You, I can't talk about special education without talking about this triangle. When you're in education, we know about what this triangle is. Um, and it is, you know, where we talk about accommodations. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about tier one, tier two, tier three. And what that just simply means is the majority of students should be receiving these universal um, ac accommodations, but not good teaching practice. Um, and a smaller population of people needs of students needs some more targeted interventions and then special education should really be a really small very targeted group of students who need specially designed instruction um, our numbers aren't a, at 80 15 5 as you, you guys have seen but um, we, we certainly strive to be there and there's um, again which is why I say you can't necessarily we can't start at the top, so my conversation can't be starting about ta talking about the top and really needs to be talking about that, that green area. Um, and we, we, we have been doing and will continue to do a lot of education around um, the tier one and tier two. So um, I, I, I'm gonna talk a little bit about UDL first, um, for some re just because for some reason I noticed as I was going through, I did slides. So when I talk about, when we talk about tier one, we're talking about UDL, which is Universal Design for Learning. We're talking about our DCAP, which is our District Curriculum Accommodation Plan, um, and we're talking about some of the SEL stuff that Nikki's already talked, spoken about in, in previous um, um, meetings. Um, so what universal design is, um, is a lot of it is good teaching practices, but it's really making sure that every student is getting what they need in a learning situation. So it is in, inclusions, uh, inclusion settings are the best place for um, UDL practices to happen and when I I'm just going to give some just really basic examples when we when we speak about UDL it's knowing the students in front of you it's knowing what they need it's saying um, for um, this content we are going to present it via text and via audio because not everybody is a text-based person and not necessarily everybody is an audio based person for assessments maybe we're going to do um, an art project and we're gonna do a traditional te essay test um, so there's it, it's just it's looking at a student strength based to understand what their needs are and the best way for them to be able to express their knowledge through different ways so the end result should be the same but the vehicles could be many different things and that has um, in education these days really become one of the most important factors um, in with the pandemic it has um, pretty pretty significantly increased the need for teachers to come right, we say teachers need to come to the classroom with these five tools now they need to come to the classroom with 15 tools so, so it's not enough to just come with your your kind of tricks in the bag of like this this works for this person it's really knowing the individual the needs of the student um, and how to implement UDL we t we'll all talk a little bit about um, we, we have had um, in conjunction with uh, general education teachers, um, some training with UDL, which we're gonna expand into next year as well. Um, SEL, I think I have that on the next, I, I think the next slide is um, the DCAP. And 
the DCAP. Our DCAP is linked right to our website, and every district in the Commonwealth needs to have a, a district accommodation plan, a district curriculum accommodation plan, and this is really what good, these, these are just, I want to make posters, they're just good teaching practices. Um, so um, if you want to just go, I just, just gave some really basic examples. So in curriculum, these are some areas, I won't read them, that um, are just, these are not accommodations, these aren't special, you don't need an IEP or a 504 for these, this is just what teachers can provide in a classroom. Uh, behavioral strategies. Uh, and organizational strategies. And again, these are just examples that no one needs permission to um, provide a daily schedule or an agenda. You don't need, no teacher needs permission to do a um, oral test as opposed to a written test. Those are not things that need to be set out in an IP or a 504. They are just mm -hmm. practices. Uh, responsive classroom, I won't go into this too much because I know Nikki already uh, spoke about it, but that's another um, sort of tier one. Um, it's an ev evidence-based approach to address our, I mean, social-emotional needs. Um, they, each school has a uh, responsive classroom, I don't know, head, I don't know what you call them. Um, each school has two responsive classroom facilitators, facilitators this year. And they, on Wednesday, did at the elementary level, that this is where they are. Um, they did trainings with their individual staffs this Wednesday, and we will continue those um, next year. And we also have already worked out a schedule for next year. Um, our specialist schedule, which is always a, a pretty big task, um, Joe Clark takes that on. And we have built in at every school a, um, a time, very specific time, that is left open for responsive classroom as we move forward. So, and this is, that's the first time we've had that at all schools. That's great. Tier two supports, and this is where, um, again, curriculum and special ed sort of intersect a little bit and have a lot of conversations. I, I can't say enough about uh, Chris Nando and Ben Cabrera and um, Carol Larcombe and their communication and support of trying to kind of bridge, it should, should really be a fluid system between general ed and special education, to, and, and they are, um, three really important people outside of Lorene who make that happen. Um, so we know when we're going into eligibility or talking to teachers about student needs or families about student needs, what's available and what should be happening at a tier two level before we even start to talk about special education. Um, it is not appropriate, fair, um, to jump to qualifying a student with a disability. Again, something I feel really passionate about. Um, and, I, and this tier two piece of it is such an important aspect of um, remediating needs before they get to um, needing a, a significant intervention like special education. Um, and then we talk about just general inclusion support. So these are non-programs. These are just some examples of some of the specially designed instruction. Um, most, of, most specially designed instruction is reading based and writing based. There's not a huge amount of specially designed instruction just in general around math, um, but it's, it's the method in which teachers are able to break down the math process, um, whether it be language or uh, executive functioning or um, looking at um, scaffolding. Um, so again, those are just certainly not an exhaustive list, but I think popular ones that people are, are familiar with. And in the district, um, again, each one of these could probably be a presentation within themselves. Mm -hmm. These are our programs at the uh, ABECC. They have intensive programs, and those are really our RISE programs, so our, and our multiple support programs. Um, and new, um, again, Mary Lou was super passionate about the need for this, uh, we, they call it the SIP program. Um, so it's an integrated preschool program, so it's for preschool students who I mean, they weren't the, in the, necessarily in the intensive programs, and they get some level of inclusion support, but needed some additional time outside of the classroom for lagging skills. Um, Atkinson has a partial inclusion program um, that has um, been a pretty much an institution here in, in North Andover for quite some time. And those students are predominantly in, the, in their general education settings for all of the day, aside from me, me, predominantly ELA and math, in which they're in a small group. Uh, Kittredge has the one of the therapeutic programs. Um, the program tends to be 
um, based on student need as it is right now, more of an inclusive setting. So what they do have is an additional uh, counselor and special education teacher that's dedicated to the program. So if students who are included need that additional support, they have that additional support. Um, the language-based program grades two through five. So those are taught by, um, so there's two, there's a second, third grade classroom and a fourth, fifth grade classroom. They are taught and co-taught, taught by both classrooms, are taught by a dual certified general education and special education teacher and co-taught um, in whatever areas. It's usually writing an ELA by a special education teacher um, who's also certified in many of the programs that you saw on the earlier page. Um, Franklin has our RISE 1 and 2 programs. What we've been able to do is Again, another, another North Andover in, uh, institution and wonderful um, Deb Swenson has come out of the RISE program as a teacher. She spends a lot of time consulting to the program, but what we really needed to do was align the programs throughout the district, so she's been really helpful in that. Um, and Sargent with the, has the MSP program, which is the multiple supports program, which is the most of our most needy um, and just amazing students and teachers in there. Um, and there's a learning skills program, and those are students who really have significant academic deficits um, who will then filter into, you'll see oftentimes, a, a life skills program, and they have that for grades uh, one through five at um, Sargent. And so you'll see m most of the programs um, at that we have at the elementary school, uh, or all we have at the high school as well, learning skills, as I said, turn into high school. We still have the RISE program, multiple sport program, we have, they have done just amazing things at the middle school level with their language-based programming. So there's language-based programming and there's also language-based teams. So there's not every kid needs necessarily language-based programming, but they're on a team that has, um, we have sent both the general education and, and um, special education teachers and TAs um, to Landmark for training over the summertime. Um, we sent, I don't know, close to 20 <coughs> general education teachers over the past couple of years and uh, TAs to um, learn about uh, the language, but what, what a language-based learning disability is at Landmark. Um, we also have a consultant from Landmark um, who works directly with those programs on co-teaching. Um, and we also have the partial inclusion program similar to what they have at um, Atkinson. And so um, in, in terms of where those programs go, RISE Life Skills MSP turn into vocational and pre-vocational programming at the, or pre-vocational at the younger years and younger years and vocational program and at the older years and then at, we, she's not a program but she is, she is uh, Kristen Newman, I'll just call her out <laughs> because she um, typically takes students who are, um, maybe need some partial inclusion support. So, um, but we've also, um, you know, it, it's not always needed, but we've also um, had two teachers at the high school level go through the Wilson certification program as well. So just to be able to have that support, typically, you know, we're, they're not getting that level of instruct phonics instruction, um, but maybe still in ninth grade they are. So we we implemented that as well, and then our transition opportunity program, which um, is what I'm going to do in my where I'm going to work in my next life. Um, <laughs> because it's just a wonderful place to be and they do, uh, they have amazing community-based partnerships and jobs and those, that's for our 18 to 22 population of students who um, have not been able to obtain a, a, dipl a diploma and um, or we feel like have not met um, criteria for meeting um, transition needs. And then uh, these are just some things that we've done again for PD over the year and resources. I talked a little bit about Emily Pat and she, um, these are really in collaboration, um, headed, really, uh, kind of started by Loreen, but it was uh, both general education and special education teachers, some UDL training, literacy training, and the math training. Um, we know about Sarah Ward. Alan Bloom has been a, an amazing resource here. He continues to work with our new teachers on a yearly basis about, and that's really about aligning the IEP process. I talked about the uh, Wilson Level 1 certification and the landmark outreach already. And then just coming attractions, if anyone wants to Google her, she's fantastic. We, I, myself and some of the principals and other leaders in the district went to go see um, Dr. Lisa Deeker and she is um, a uh, wonderful speaker from Florida and she, she is 
as passionate uh, as me about the need for uh, more inclusive opportunities and inclusion in our in our schools. Um, and so she will be our keynote speaker um, at the beginning of the school year. We're going to continue and expand, as I said, our, our um, UDL training with teachers with Emily Pat, and then continue to increase our uh, program, Wilson program, and other research evidence-based programs for around reading. So that is still part of the plan moving into next year. Awesome. Right. I, I love your closing quote. There yes. Yeah. Uh, Just have to throw it in there. It's fantastic. Um, I think the committee may have some questions, so uh, virtually I'll start with you, Ms. Picard. Yeah, thank you very much. It's really been a tremendous presentation. Um, I do have a, a few comments and questions. Um, I would thank you, um, like I thank the students for naming names, uh, you know, the people who are actually doing this work and who are really, you know, they're heroes in our schools, and I appreciate you um, bringing their names um, forward. Um, I just wanted to, to mention the, the correlation with um, UDL and our goals for small class sizes. We really are trying to meet the needs of individual students, and if you have 30 kids in a class, um, that's just not really possible. So um, it's important that we as a committee remember um, that that's why we're doing it. We're not just doing it to, you know, to have a number that sounds good to the kids. We're doing it because it's best teaching practices um, or it provides the opportunity for, um, for good teaching practices. Um, and, I heard you say like it's just good teaching practices, and I just, I just don't think that we can we can minimize how important that is. Um, how much we've learned about the science of learning, <clears throat> things like including an agenda with objectives and goals. Um, when I was starting in teaching in in 1989, like there was so much resistance to that, and like we don't have meetings without agendas, so why would we expect students to be able to uh, be in a learning setting without an agenda? Um, and so we do that all the time, and it's really huge, and it's really exciting. Um, and I'm thrilled that um, part of your presentation included safe, joyful, and engaging um, settings, right? I mean, we need joy. We need joy every day, and I don't know that all schools are making sure that their special education presentation has the word joyful in it, so I, I celebrate you um, for doing that. Um, and then thinking back at earlier part of the um, of the presentation when we were looking at percentages of IEPs in the schools, um, and the percentage of IEPs at Thompson was down, and recognizing that um, there's not a, a particular um, significantly separate uh, program at Thompson, that might be one of the reasons that that has lower numbers, I'm guessing. Potentially, I, the thing about the thing with IEPs is that it's it's the numbers don't necessarily reflect the needs, so. Um, service delivery what a student is getting as opposed like you could have the needs of one student um, and again this could be at any school so part of what we did also as part of the process is look at minutes and hours and caseloads and outside of the program so to your point Helen that is correct outside of the program pro the, the specific programs our inclusion teachers have actually pretty um, there's a couple like outliers, but pretty consistent um, service delivery minutes and hours. So interestingly enough, that was kind of something that we saw through kind of just our own sort of data dive a couple, maybe two months ago. And when you talk about 504 plans, we don't have the numbers for IEPs by school here. No, it's oh, just, that doesn't we, have a rise program or the whatever. Total number, the total school. numbers, maybe, I don't know. Oh. We yeah. had uh, we had earlier. I'm sorry. It's not the number of IEPs, but the but the number of identified disabilities. Uh, okay. Yeah. From from very early on that we had the, the year over year comparison. Right. Yeah. This. Yep. Yeah. I don't have IEPs by school. Correct. Right. It's 504 is by school. Um. And then, I, I just I I might be the oldest person in the room, other than um, perhaps Mr. Limpert is there still. <laughs> um, when I started school, we, we didn't have inclusion of all. Um, students, it just didn't exist. Um, and I have an uncle who was excluded from public schools. Um, he's in his 80s now and um, really a terrific contributing member of, of our society, but no thanks to what was offered in public schools at the time. Um, so it, it's not that long that we've been doing this. And I really do celebrate um, how well um, we're able to, um, to, to, to include the raised values um, for our students. So I really appreciate your presentation and I'm done for now. Thank you for listening, Mr. McDevitt. 
Uh, Ms. Petrowski. Um, I don't think I have any questions. I probably want to join in in some of your conversations and what you have about like universal design and all inclusion and all of those things because that's what I'm doing every day and working hard to get our students involved in the school community and how to join things and how to fill out those like we were talking about your parent liaisons like how to fill out a form I'm doing that with my students trying to register them for baseball this season like and all those things so um, no it's just nice to hear that all of this is happening in our schools it's 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 awesome thank you Holly no questions um, I just want to say I love your passion and I too could talk about this forever so I, I get it um, I you know, I would tell you that since you've come on board, I get far fewer people pulling me aside and asking me questions, um, which is a testament to you and your staff, and it's been such a breath of fresh air. I, we love having you here. Um, and I think the, for the public, uh, just to emphasize one of her points, you know, bringing all those programs, that allows us to keep more kids in district. I mean, these programs are phenomenal. Mm -hmm. um, Language-based is one of the biggest out of district um, reasons people go out of district and to have all that here is incredible so it's gonna make a huge difference yeah and a huge difference with kids so I mean it really that's yeah a so I know it, like the words don't mean a lot yep. to, to a lot of people but that is actually really really tremendous so thank you actually related to that can you clarify what language based means it doesn't mean EL no nope. it doesn't mean EL so. it's students with language based needs it's typically you know the students who have a phonics based need, a print disability, dyslexia, uh, and those are the primary disabilities that fall into that program. Right. Not every student with a specific learning disability in reading, writing, dyslexia, whatever it is, requires a language-based program. So the, the, the piece about it is that we have very uh, high achieving students who have not learned how to decode text but they still need access to a, maybe an honors level classroom while being, and that's where the UDL piece is so important, while being taught to read, because that is a disability area, they need to have, be able to have access to typical grade level material, but not in print. So those are, again, those where those kind of things intersect too. Thanks, I just want to make sure that was clear because mm -hmm. when you hear language-based, not, mm -hmm. not everybody knows, knows what that means. Yeah. Yep. Um, my only comment, I, I love this, thank you very much, and it's true, your, your passion. I know that Maureen shares your passion as well, and, and so thank you for all of what you all and all your team is doing. Um, the responsive classroom, so my kids went to Thompson, and, and also at daycare, they, had, they did the responsive classroom mm -hmm. with the daycare we used, and Thompson, was one of the first schools in the district, I think, that did that. So I was almost surprised that I didn't know it was a district-wide thing until years ago I found out it wasn't. Mm -hmm. So I'm thrilled to hear that it is done district-wide. I, I do think it makes a huge difference. And it was one of those things that was that was up and coming and then kind of went, and it's, you know, many, many districts are using it too. Yeah, I, I just think it's, um, it's part of that community building mm -hmm. and, and it's so critical to how kids go through their academic career. So. Mm -hmm. Excellent work. Thank you for all this. And um, I really feel like, again, in my six years doing this, this has come a really long way. And it was an area, <laughs> it's an area that was, yeah. was hurting when, at, I, I, yeah. when I first came here six years ago. So. And just to keep the bucket, like I, in the conversation, we can do more. So I don't want, you know, right. again, community listening, it's, we're not in a perfect situation. Oh, no, for sure. And we'll continue to grow and do more and shift as we need to shift. Yeah, no, and, and, and just being open to that is excellent, <laughs> so thank you. Um, I'll, I'll just take a couple of quick minutes. I, I think a number of the questions that I had, um, you actually addressed um, as someone I anticipated. Um, but I'll just say this, you know, I think a lot of times, you know, you're here in the meetings and there's a lot of things that, you know, I think we lean on you to kind of answer some questions and things. But when, when you come and you present the material that you did today, um, as well as you did today, you're so passionate about the services that we're providing to our kids, the team that you have that helps you to deliver these. When I look at the programs, um, that we have here and some of them you know you you, you kind of forget that they're even at some of these schools mm -hmm. and these programs but you know to just document them all out I mean I think is a huge testament to how how valuable 
you are to the district and and i just want to say thank you for that um uh, it's really awesome and and one of the things that i really loved kind of seeing is you know when you look at the services you know and this is a little bit of what you know other people have mentioned as well they continue as the students need right you know like we used to see those transitions um from one school or you know one you know elementary middle you know etc um and kids would need to go out of district because we didn't have that program and, and we've spent a lot of time and a lot of money to kind of put those programs into place and and there certainly were families who i think you know were there the first year and you know um but you know the programs have continued to run and we've seen the result of that with keeping our students and as many of them as possible close to home and local and i think that that um that is so important uh for them and i think it you know it's not about the physical proximity i'm, I'm just looking at your close but, you know it's really about them them being here and the, and the planning mm-hmm. for that um and i i just again want to say thank you uh and i think it's another like sort of get out and vote conversation too because when we say capacity and resources we have we could talk about resources all day long and i think we have a great group of providers and teachers that have great ideas but the buildings aren't sufficient to unfortunately unfortunately the buildings aren't sufficient to create those programs anymore yeah. you know that's just so again <laughs> listen <laughs> again listening listening audience you know when, yes, kind of, when yes, we so. think about like the building projects and the importance of it it's just another piece of it yeah absolutely and i would just close out saying you know um it was great having Marcy present tonight. Um, she's been to a lot of meetings, and over the past couple of years, we've had a lot of very COVID-heavy meetings. And, <laughs> you know, um, I think masks and things were on there for a long time, and this is an area that we've been working on for a long time. And um, her ability, not just to build capacity, uh, but her laser focus on um, the articulation vertically, and uh, and then across, and then working hand in hand with general education, we know that that is critical and we also know that these inclusive practices like it's best when we can have the least restrictive environment for our kids and push services in and that's really you know that pyramid is what we used to call the pyramid of interventions now it's a tiered system of support and she's done a remarkable job working with Lorreen working with all the different staff to bring people together um, to do this and you know as we move forward um, I'm looking forward to do you know continuing to build capacity and I just want to say the one last thing because you guys all kind of hit on this you know, as we build capacity, we build new programming. One of the things that's ch- challenging for parents is they say, I don't want to be the first group to go through a new program. Mm-hmm. I'm nervous about this. And um, in the years past, I've seen those nerves and I've heard those nerves. And, and you know, and it's, uh, they, have, they can be valid concerns. And I think as, you know, with Marcy here at the helm, I think we, as we continue to build solid programming and do what's best for kids, she's also building trust where people realize that we're putting these things in place. Um, and, and that's critical, the trust and then the community outreach and being open. So um, thank you, Marcy. Mm-hmm. And that will end the superintendent's report. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, all right. Uh, I'm going to go a l- little bit kind of out of order. Uh, you may have noticed we had a surprise guest uh, <laughs> join us uh, from her dorm up in Maine. Uh, I won't give your physical location, but uh, hi, how are you, Claudia? Uh, I'm good. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> I, I figured she did come for the special education presentation, but uh, might as well stay for your mom too. Um, so normally we would kind of do some um, some kind of recognition roast, if you will, uh, of uh, Mrs. Mabley here. But uh, I do know that somebody has a study group that they need to attend to. So uh, so we will do this a little bit earlier. But I wanted to to have Claudia and uh, Vanessa and, and Eric here. Um, to kind of share in some moments with you. Um, so we're, we have a, um, uh, oh, there it is, sorry. Uh, we have a plaque that we wanted to uh, pre- present to you. Um, and uh, I'll just read it. Uh, to Am- this, this is presented to Amy Mabley in recognition of her outstanding contribution, dedication, and commitment to the students, staff, and families as a member of the North Andover School Committee from, it's hard to believe, 2016 to 2022. uh, And it's dated March 17, 2000, uh, just kidding, uh, 22. Uh, next Thursday.
Thursday night, we have a little thought for you. So oh, you yeah. don't necessarily have to be, you know, <laughs> glued to your TV oh, excellent. Uh, for that. Thank so, you. Uh, Thank one, you. You have to give your speech earlier. Uh, well, well, we can we can have our thoughts, or we can let Ms. Mabley go uh, last. But uh, if that's okay. Yes, please. All right. Uh, so I, I just want to take a quick minute and, and really just thank and acknowledge uh, Mrs. Mabley for uh, your dedication uh, over the past six years. And, you know, six years ago, you know, Zora was leaving, you know, you were kind of coming on board. And, um, you know, it's always kind of interesting when, when transitions happen um, on the school committee, and, and we've certainly been together for a long time. Um, but the amount of work and dedication that you have put into – uh, this district and the committee uh, is really fantastic and fabulous. And uh, I know that your family has missed you on many a night, um, or maybe not. I don't know. Maybe it, yeah. <laughs> you want us to write her in? I don't know. Um, but, you know, a couple of quick things that I just think of that I don't know where we'd be today uh, without some of your uh, commitment. And, uh, you know, when we, it's not there yet, it's coming. We'll probably have to put a plaque up uh, in, in your name, but the, uh, the fields committee uh, and serving uh, on that and, and the planning for that, you know, was, was a labor of love. And I know that you, you worked very hard, not only as a neighbor, um, but as a resident as well for that. Um, you've been a champion with the PTO presidents uh, for uh, so many years. Um, you have been our champion with policy and working with Suzanne Egan and uh, researching you know, the, the legal changes that happen uh, with all of the um, uh, policies and regulations that kind of come out. Um, I'm going to ask you to speak later on this, but, you know, the Hall of Fame as well. I mean, I think you've really kind of helped um, with how we brought that in with professional teacher status and kind of moving that to another level. Um, but I think, you know, throughout the time, you, you have always, always advocated um, in the best interest of our students and our faculty and our staff and our community. And um, uh, I will truly miss you. Uh, but it, and it has been a pleasure working with you for the last six years. Thank you. So uh, and I'll, I'll open it up uh, to, to other members of the committee. You're not required to speak, but uh, <laughs> um, I don't know. Are you inviting Ms. someone, Mr. McDevitt? Well, I, I don't want to put anyone on the spot. Like, speak now. Um. I'll speak. I'll speak. I'm, I'm getting used to going first. Okay. Um, All right. Uh, so, you, you know, you were on the committee um, while I was still a spectator to the sport, Amy. And um, yeah. this committee moved forward so well um, with your leadership in uh, I think every single year that you've served, you've had a leadership position um, on the committee and chair, vice chair, clerk. I don't think you ever had a year when you didn't have one of those responsibilities. That's true. Um, we moved from a four men, one woman uh, committee to a four women, one man committee. Um, <laughs> it's just an <laughs> interesting thing. I don't think it's you know, better The or vote worse. is decided. Yeah. <laughs> um, but... You have done so much to build the relationships between committee members so that we can do the work that we need to do together. We, um, we can disagree without being disagreeable, um, and you encourage us to really put our, our best thoughts forward um, in the best way we can. And I, uh, I just feel like you, you embody Rays. I will miss you a great deal, and I will expect that you will send me a joke by text um, about <laughs> once a week. <laughs> So you have been delightful and diligent, and I appreciate it so much. Thank you. So we just go in order? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, so Amy, just thank you so much for welcoming me and helping me transition into this role. Um, it just I'm going to miss sitting next to you and joking with you and catching up on just, you know, everyday life. and. I wish you would still be there, but I wish you well, and thank you. We could still keep in touch. We're like kind of neighbors. That's true. <laughs> I'd walk by your house on occasion. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. So it's hard to um, not repeat what everybody else has said because I echo everything they've said. Um, but I would add to that: you are just the voice of reason on this committee, um, and I mean that in the very truest sense of the word. You're not going to talk a lot, but when you do talk, it's always going to be relevant and it's going to be on point, it's going to be intelligent, and it's going to be thoughtful. You, you really put some thought into your words, and you choose them carefully, 
and you bring in different perspectives, which I think is very valuable. Um, you never speak just to say something, right? You always have a, a reason behind it and a good one. Um, what I've also noticed is that you are not afraid to cast the hard vote. Um, <laughs> I will never forget the time you were chair and you had like the deciding vote on an issue um, around uh, how a process was gonna take place. And that, that's a tough position to be when you're 2-2 two, two, and you're the last vote. That's really hard with the whole world watching you, it feels like. Um, but you do it gracefully and you actually of, often cast votes against your personal wishes because you put the kids first, the students first, um, and the community, which I think Andrew has already said. Um, you were probably one of the reasons I decided to run because you know, I knew you as a friend and you, I wouldn't say you talked me into it, but you made me feel comfortable doing it, you know. Um, you have just a nice calming presence on the committee and we're definitely gonna miss that for sure. But I think the first, and Andrew's already touched on this, but the first word that comes to mind when I think of you is volunteer. No matter what it is, you are the first one to sign up, first one to volunteer. It doesn't even have to be in your wheelhouse. You've been at, I think, Special Olympics every single year. You, you know, we're talking last meeting about doing the reading to Across America. It doesn't matter what it is. With NAPAC, you were our best volunteer and you weren't even on NAPAC <laughs> when I was chair. So um, it's just a testament to the person you are, right? It's not anything uh, selfish. It's just because that's the person you are and you want to give. So I know you're going to keep volunteering, so I'm not going to say we're going to miss you there because <laughs> you, you'll still be doing that. But thank, thank you, and I'm definitely going to miss serving with you. Thank you. It's overwhelming, guys. <laughs> Can I add one thing? Of course. I'm Mr. Chair. Um, I, I can't add any more than you guys have added, so <laughs> I'm glad I'm going, saying something last year. Um, but someone, I think it was Holly, just talked about being a public servant. And so uh, this goes beyond bef well before 2016. I think <laughs> I met Miss Mabley when I was principal of the Thompson School back in 2008, and I think Claudia might have started kindergarten then. First grade. First grade, <laughs> if the math is right. And um, so she was really involved in the PTO. And before you knew it, she was now the editor for Paw Prints, the, daily, the weekly newspaper that we would put out on Fridays. Um, and anything that had to be done at the Thompson School, she did it. And just as everyone said here, um, you know, it's just that public service, her selflessness and dedication to everyone here in North Andover, um, it, it, I'm just gonna miss it. Um, you've been a good um, person to bounce ideas off of, and more than anything, you always think of kids first. And um, just, I will miss you. <laughs> Thank you. Wow, so <laughs> feels, uh, I'm honored, thank you. All the words are, are really great. I, I was thinking the same thing. Uh, uh, my children started, Claudia started at the Thompson School as a first grader the year that Dr. Gilligan started as the principal there. Um, she did not go to kindergarten. We kept her daycare in kindergarten because Vanessa was born like three days before the first day of kindergarten and that we decided that was too much to do all at once. Um, but so we started our journey um, in North Andover Public Schools in 2008. Um, and we've, as we've seen tonight, just through Marcy's presentation, seen massive changes for the better. Um, a little anecdote is right before Claudia was starting at Thompson and we were on the soccer field and some families were saying, oh, you know, well, what school or is your child gonna be in? I'm like, well, we're gonna be at Thompson. And it was right when Thompson had become, like, a, I think a, you could have mm. moved out of it. And people like, you've gotta move her right away. It's terrible, you shouldn't start there. I'm like, well, we haven't even been in the door yet. We're, we're, we're not gonna react like that. We're gonna go and see what happens at the Thompson School. It's our neighborhood school, we can walk. And it was a spectacular school for our children. Um, both very successful students and, um, the community at Thompson is amazing. The teachers are amazing. Dr. Gilligan and Ms. Marks have both been, been principals there. Uh, so had I listened to the gossip, you know, had Eric and I listened to the gossip, it would have been different. But we, you know, decided for ourselves, and it was a spectacular school. Um, and even the difference between Claudia and Vanessa, a five-year difference, we saw huge improvements between the two as they went up through the system as things improved in the district. So that was really, really great. Um, the whole reason I ran for school committee, we kind of had it, is because I liked volunteering, and I, I honestly thought that it was just kind of an extension of that. Um, little did I know that I was going to have to 
you know, decide mask policies and things like that. But, um, you know, it's part of what, how things turned out. So um, still glad that I, I did that. Um, this, you know, the role of the school committee, as, as we know, because we're members, is to partner with the administration, the team, the teachers, and, and the families to give the best education for our, our, our kids. And um, we're not here to set curriculum. We're not here to, to do all that work. We're here to support Dr. Gilligan and his team, you know, Jim, Lorene, Marcy, principals, um, Cheryl Barzak, all of that. And um, we couldn't do that if you didn't have a good team that, that you helped really to build Dr. Gilligan. I'm, I'm happy to say, and Andrew someday will be able to list a lot of them, but um, there have only been, in my six years, there have been two superintendents. And one of our goals was to make sure we didn't hit three in six years, right? Because that's kind of how things have been going. Mm -hmm. So, hey, we broke that, <laughs> we broke that chain. And, and the team that, you, that you've built um, allows the team that, frankly, we've built to work together to, to do some pretty great things, even through the last two years that have been pretty gross um, in, in a lot of ways, by nobody's fault. Um, but as your team, as you guys as a team, you've put everything on the map to be ready to take advantage of, of you know, Facilities Master Plan 2. Um, the COVID money that has helped us get into place, what you'd already put together, which is a strategic plan, like you didn't have to suddenly put that together. You were already working that way. Um, so I'm super proud that we as a team could partner um, with, with you guys as a team. And honestly, it's, it's interesting, other than um, Mr. Limpert and Brian Gross and Pam, we've, at, with, with David Trissi, Helen, uh, Holly, Andrew, David and I were a team for four to my six years. So that's, I don't think, typical either. And I think that that's allowed for good things to happen. So, so I, I think that um, you have to stay at least two terms is kind of how it goes. <laughs> <laughs> and I would be remiss uh, to, to not thank the students over the years. They've been fantastic. And it's just a testament. You know, you see how, how articulate and passionate and caring they are. And that's because of the system that they've been through, um, as well as from their families. So I'm thankful to them. And um, the number one thing that everybody who has talked to us over the last couple of years and voiced their opinions on, you know, good and bad, I appreciate that. But what you really have to do now is you have to go and vote because that's how you, um, you know, keep things going. So I'm honored. Thank you. I will miss this a lot. Some of the things I will miss a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I will certainly be around to be helpful in the future. So thank you, guys. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, know, I, know. I don't know Hall of Fame. Um, uh, so I know I know I wanted Claudia uh, to have a chance to you know just kind of hear us say, yeah. say thank you. Um, oh, that's so and, kind um, of you to invite her. You know, you're, you're welcome to stay. I think you have a study group you're late for, <laughs> or two. <laughs> Um, I have two exams tomorrow, but thank two you. Exams, right. <laughs> I'm sure you were not multitasking as Marcy was presenting. But, um, all right, awesome. Well, Thanks, good luck Claude, on your exams. Yeah. We expect days. Thanks. Great job, Mom. <laughs> Thanks, honey. <laughs> you guys are sweet to have done that. Thank you. Um, all right, so I actually don't have uh, a ton in the chair's report, uh, and we'll kind of move things along. I was going to recognize uh, Marie Hurst and... Uh, Abigail Phillips uh, for being the first two uh, from North Andover to uh, achieve their uh, Eagle Scout rank. Um, and I didn't realize this, but I think it's only been about two and a half years that Eagle Scouts um, have been eligible uh, for women. So mm -hmm. uh, for the length of time it takes uh, to somebody for somebody to become an Eagle Scout, um, you know, is, is obviously fantastic. And, and I think they knew it was probably coming in the work, but works. But, uh, you know, two amazing projects that were there as well. A couple of quick things that I do want to let people know and understand. Um, with Amy uh, leaving in uh, technically, I think, two weeks or, or 
12 days. Um, Amy represents us on a number of individual committees within that, so we will uh, dust off our committee kind of roles and responsibilities on the meeting of the 31st and kind of see if there's any reshuffling that we need to do on that as well. We will also uh, start the formation of school building uh, committees as well. Um, I do, we've got some, some work that we need to do within the next couple of weeks uh, with Jim, Suzanne, uh, Dr. Gilly, and myself uh, with that. But I thought it was really important as we started that process to make sure that the board that is um, uh, going to be here for the next uh, at least a year um, was here. And so I really kind of didn't want to roll that. No offense, Amy. No, but, it makes um, sense. <laughs> uh, I just thought that it made sense for us to do that. Um, and then the, the last thing, if you don't mind speaking to just mm -hmm. a little bit um, in terms of Hall of Fame. Yes. Um, because we will, that is kind of a vice chair um, kind of role and responsibility. We will also be reorganizing uh, the school committee uh, next week with uh, the vacancy of the vice chair right. uh, position as well. So sure. um, when does, was that open? I feel like So it's, it's been open. It's, it's kind of a rolling. We changed things around a lot a couple of years ago, but it's open at any time. But the deadline for submissions is April 30th. Okay. Um, there were a couple of people who we changed our policy a couple of years ago. If people who had been nominated in the past and they weren't chosen, they stay in the pool. Um, and so, but a couple of those need a little bit more information. So I will um, remind them, chase after them, the, the nominators to see if they can give more information for some of those other candidates. And obviously other candidates are, are encouraged as well. But April 30th is kind of the, the closing of it for this year. And then um, the new vice chair will have to form a committee uh, to look at those nominations. Okay. Awesome. And then they will, will get chosen in June, I think. I can't even remember anymore. Um, and then the ceremony will be in the fall, like it has been for the last few years. So. Right. Awesome. All right. And that is all I had uh, as we kind of move forward. So, Dr. Mealy, you want to help bring us the back, back half here? So, update on the um, facilities, facilities master, master plan. plan. Yep. yep. We will be getting communications out from open the door we've been meeting with them um, so you'll start seeing uh, things coming out regarding um, well from both the school department and the town um, regarding the projects and the facility mass plan and trying to educate people <coughs> um, we have a meet a what we're calling a town hall meeting on April 4th uh, that will allow people to attend ask questions send in questions uh, in order to try to educate as much as possible as well. Um, what else did I want to talk about? Uh, I did connect with the uh, project coordinator that they've assigned us. Emma Parrish is her name. And found out that our clock doesn't actually start ticking until September 1st. So the 30 days to have the certificate executed and then the 60 days to put together the um, school building committee doesn't start uh, counting until September 1st. So she said we're well ahead of the game. I did talk through the fact that we have a charter that dictates who can be on the um, school building committee. But in talking through it, it's not going to be difficult to be able to meet uh, the requirements of both because while their requirements have 11 and even if you count the last one, 12 um, different variables for, for membership, somebody could be one, two, or three of those. So it doesn't have to be a single person for each one. So we talked through that, and, and that should be easy enough. But in the meantime, we can start thinking about who's going to be on that. Yep. Um, but I just wanted to let everyone know that the clock doesn't officially start ticking until September 1. If we're ready earlier, to, can we start the process earlier, or do we really wait until September 1? Well, we have to wait until September 1. But we don't have to wait until September 30th and then October right. 30th. So we can, once September 1 hits, we can be ready to go and um, get the process going quicker than it, it normally would. Gotcha. Okay. Yep. Awesome. All right. Uh, questions from the committee? We'll start uh, virtually. I'm, I'm seeing a head shake. No? Okay. All right. Awesome. Um, Anything else? It look like, did you have a question, Dr. Gillen? Uh, no, I was going to add something, but it, it's, it's been covered, so we're fine. Okay. All right. Awesome. All right. So we will move on to public comment. <laughs> Stan is racing. Uh, <laughs> the opportunity. Uh, 
Three quick things. First is I wanted to uh, compliment Dr. Mealy on the presentation on Monday at the Joint Select Board Planning Board meeting. I think they had raised a red herring about 89 students were going to result in a our need to build a new elementary school, something. And uh, Dr. Mealy very effectively answered the question, I thought, and explained why. We knew what we were doing, we had a plan, and we were going to do that, and that wasn't going to be a problem. So I, I think you did a really good job with that, Jim. That was good. The second thing was, let me echo your comment, uh, Ms. Mabley. Imagine what it was like before you showed up. That's right. When I joined the committee in 2008, one of the most disconcerting things about the job suddenly became special education because it seemed like such a an ill-defined area that seemed like a black hole for money. I mean, it was just, it, it seemed scary to me because it seemed like we were, doing, we were doing all this work to create budgets and try to get money and everything, and then there was this place where money could just, you know, there was just a sink for money, and we had no control over it. It seemed really scary to me. And it wasn't all that clear how the process worked, you know, how it worked and who the people were and what we needed to do. This is night and day. This is light years ahead of that. It's surprising to me to finally hear sort of what this is all about and how it ought to work. I mean, this is dramatic. And I think we as a community should be grateful that we've come this far because not only are we providing the services that our students need and our families need, but we're doing it in a very inclusive, community-oriented way. So. I can't tell you how far we've come. It's, it's amazing. It's very dramatic. So my only addition to the, comment, to the comments that have been made about you, Ms. Mabley, is I'll miss your sunny dispos disposition on the committee. You're always sort of a ray of sunshine for all of us, so that's something that I will miss. Thank you so much for stepping up to this responsibility and taking this job on for six years. You've done a great job, so thank you. Thank you. Like a ray of sunshine may come back around the house <laughs> a little bit. So. I'm going to have to make sure that my family remembers that <laughs> when I'm yelling. I see, a, I see a plaque in the kitchen going up. <laughs> Any other public comment? All right. uh, member comments? Uh, Ms. Picard? Yep, I would just um, mention that those two Eagle Scout projects, um, Marie's project was building a composting toilet at the Giving Garden. Um, and the Giving Garden helps feed, um, helps uh, produce, put produce in the um, uh, food pantries in the area. And um, Abigail's um, project was to uh, build, install, and fill shelves for diapers at Neighbors in Need and Community Giving Tree. Um, so usually people want to know what the project was, but you know, making Eagle is. It's more than just the project. It is really years of work that these um, two young women have done in a condensed time. So really exciting. Um, and Marie was also first in the Northern Lights District, which is 13 communities um, in our area, um, starting with us and then kind of going north um, east of um, North Andover. So. Awesome. Is it a job? No, I don't have any comments. Thank you. All right. I want to wish good luck to Matthew McDevitt tomorrow night. <laughs> <laughs> all the contestants. <laughs> all the contestants. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's true. Um, I actually agree with um, something that was made in public comment, which was I went to that meeting on Monday night. And um, it's a huge, important time uh, for all of us. I mean, our projects that we care about are tied into, frankly, um, what was presented on a certain level with the um, Royal Crest project. And so it's really important that people um, make themselves aware of what's what's entailed and, and and what a difference that can make or might you know whatever for our community and I, I do agree that uh, Dr. Mealy did an excellent job fielding some questions um, it's funny because it's the question that you I think you've answered 854 <laughs> times in the last couple of years but you continue to answer it with patience and um, clarity so thank you it was very well done but that, that's an important thing for all of us that, that and all those watching, again, <clears throat> you have to go out and, and participate and vote because um, that's what allows us to get things done. Right. Uh, just uh, 
couple very fast things. Um, just a point of reflection. Uh, approximately two years ago, you know, we were meeting. It was a Thursday night, <laughs> mid-March. Um, you know, March 12th. March 12th. <laughs> yeah, one of the biggest conversations that we were having or about even as we were kind of leaving was whether or not Mr. North Andover was going to take place in the auditorium. <laughs> That's right. Um, that was a huge thing, and, you know, uh, it, it was virtual um, or, or recorded, and then, you know, we, we um, I think it was that Sunday night they d made the decision that they were going to close schools in the state for two weeks, and, uh, um, I mean, two weeks it would be done, it would be over, and, you know, we'd be back to normal, and here we are two years um, and I think I said this when the students were here, you know, it's just so amazing to see so many things kind of um, being, I'm not saying resurrected, but kind of coming back in, in a um, more traditional way. And uh, it's taken us a long time to get here. Um, and uh, it's, it's been tough, but I, I really appreciate having you here um, as part of that as well. And uh, I think I said this before, but again, thank you to Eric and, and Vanessa and Claudia for sharing her um, with us on, on Thursday nights and many other negotiating nights and all of those other things. Um, and so the last uh, thing I would just say is, you know, elections are um, uh, March 29th uh, at North Andover High School. And uh, I believe it is 7 to 8 p.m., right? Polls open at 7? I think yeah. it's 7. Um, so I, I do just want to encourage people uh, to take an opportunity to go out and vote for that. So, um, all right. There's nothing else. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion to adjourn. Oh, <laughs> do you, you want to second your own motion? <laughs> second. <laughs> uh, so motion made by Ms. Mavely, uh, seconded by Ms. Petrowski. Uh, any discussion? All right, we will uh, we'll start virtually there. Ms. Picard? Yes. Ms. Vitsky? Yes. Ms. Petrowski? Yes. The chair's going to vote yes, and Ms. Mabley? <laughs> yes. Yes. All right. We are done. Thank you.